Okay, 206. Um, so this video is going to explain the basic concepts for our test and just go over what your final exam is going to be. Um, as I've mentioned, your final exam is via Google Classroom. It will be a Google form. So if you think about your uh, daily tens, that's the type of format you'll be looking at, taking the test in the browser in Google Forms, okay? Um, the test is on Wednesday from 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. Um, on December 9th. So you have until next, basically a week from today to get this done. Um, and it will be open for you. I will be sending you a link at 10 a.m. So if you want to start at 10 a.m., you'll be waiting for a link from me via email to start it right at that time. Um, this is one of the inflexibilities of Google Classroom. It doesn't really allow me to set a window where it can be open. So I have to only let it make it available right when it's time to do it. Okay, so that's just to keep you in mind of that. So what's on the exam? 30 questions from the following slides um, or PowerPoint presentations which have all been emailed to you at this point. The first one is final exam concepts, which is what this video is going to cover today. The second one is compressors and compression um, and probably buses and sends. Those two will come together in a single video. And then I'll be, make another video probably tomorrow afternoon or on Friday about synthesizers and synthesis, which is the last video that's going to cover the concepts of your test, okay? So just a couple important notes about your test. Obviously, I cannot police you, and I'm assuming you're gonna have your notes open, um, and so I'm accepting that as a reality of this test. So because of that, um, there are a couple things. As I mentioned on Monday, if you copy and paste or quote me verbatim on the test, you will lose points, okay? So please, the important thing here is, this is the compromise if you ask me. If you have your notes open, then I expect you to explain the concepts in the test in your own words, okay? So please keep that in mind. It's an important part of this test. If a question is obviously multiple choice, it doesn't matter, but any questions that are fill in the blank, I want you to answer it with your own words and not mine, okay? Now obviously you're gonna use similar phrasing, you're gonna use similar um, words because I, the way I use them, but you know, if you copy and paste my text in there, uh, you will lose points on it, okay? Um, number three, the test is multiple choice, fill in the blank and true and false questions. Um, there'll be lots of images in the test and stuff to, to kind of uh, guide you along, stuff like that, okay? Um, the last one, you should study for this test. I know you have three hours, um, and you know, but it'd be a good idea to kind of at least get comfortable with, with all the questions. Understand the concepts, right? Instead of trying to learn the concepts while you're taking the test, um, you know, it'd be a better idea for you to sit down and know them beforehand, all right? Just to give you lots of room with the exam, okay? So let's get on to this, this part of the test then, which is the final uh, exam concepts. These are all concepts that we talked about at the beginning of the semester, right? Um, and over the course of the semester, they have kind of unfolded at various times. So the first one are general concepts about pro audio over here. And these are all things that we learned, especially from the book readings. Um, and they also pertain to all pro audio concepts. The other ones on the other side, and so does filtering, in fact, that also deals with general concepts. But then we also have some basic context related to DAWs and related to logic in particular, okay? Um, so again, if you came to class on Monday, then all of this is review. And this, this is what this video is meant to do is be a review for you, okay? So the first thing is, again, the hertz, okay? A, a hertz is a, a unit of measurement. That It's a measurement of frequency um, which in particular is measured as cycles per second, right? And um, humans sense hertz as pitch, okay? So as I, you know, I like to use the analogy again of the inch or any sort of the kilometer, right? Uh, the kilometer is the name that we've given a certain length of, uh, a certain length of something, right? Same thing with the inch, one inch, is the, is the name of the link uh, of one in of a measurement of size and that's what a hurt is as well right a hurt is the name of the cycles per second it's also the length of a wavelength okay and if we um you know if i go over here to max 
I can make some sine waves here. You know, if I make a basic sine wave, um, the wavelength is how many of these cycles are happening per second. And as this slows down, you'll see the wavelengths get longer, right? So the cycle per second is longer, okay? And that's the basic concept with um, wave or with a hertz. And again, humans hear this as pitch, right? We identify these sounds as pitch. Okay, so pitch is again, pitch is determined by human listeners as the frequency. Frequency is measured as cycles per second, hertz. The higher the frequency, more cycles per second, right? The higher humans hear the pitch. The lower the frequency, the lower humans hear the pitch. So based on my little example here again, um, you can see that there are less wavelengths over the course of this image here, but as I increase this to maybe 12,000 hertz, you'll see there are way more, oh, that's awful sound. There are way more cycles per second in the, way, in the window, right? Even 5,000, let's do 6,000, that's more manageable. So there are more cycles per second going on um, over the course of this sound, all right? And that's basically how we determine pitch to our ears, okay? Um, the next one is the wavelength. The wavelength is a unit of measurement consisting of one peak compression and one trough, which is called rarefaction of a, a waveform, okay? Compression, and obviously the opposite of compression is that something, um, you know, compressed air moves to not compressed air, right? Or to air that has negative pressure. And so that's how a waveform propagates. And one wavelength is one compression, one peak and one trough, okay? We often talk about it as a one peak and one trough. Another term you hear sometimes is what's called peak to peak. And that means the top of the peak here in the compression to the next peak, okay? Which is essentially the same thing. If I go, from the top to the bottom and then up to the top again, it's the same wavelength as what I have here in this image, okay? So that's what a wavelength is. It's a unit of measurement of one peak and one trough of a waveform. Resonance, so we talked about this on Monday, is the reinforcement or prolongation of sound by reflection from a surface or by the synchronous vibration, synchronous vibration of a neighboring object, okay? So remember, all sound in our world takes place inside space, right? So how that space sounds is what's called resonance. In addition to resonance is what we use as what's called a resonator, okay? In a musical instrument, a resonator comes in many shapes and sizes, the barrel of a drum, the body of a cello, or the shape of a guitar, right? Or the shape of a flute. Any instrument, every instrument has a body and that body is designed to make the sound amplify and to uh, create, kind of shape the sound in what we recognize as a violin or a cello or what have you, right? And that's what resonance is, in addition to the idea that something resonates inside a space, right? Um, so my bathroom sounds way different than, you know, um, Hewitt Ballroom in terms of sound because of the space that the sound occurs in. And that's what resonance is, okay? The next one is amplitude. This is a classic, simple concept of the loudness or the, the intensity of a sound, right? Amplitude is the measurement of intensity for a waveform and is represented by the x-axis on the visualizer, meaning that the up, um, up and down, right? Gain allows us to increase or decrease the intensity or amplitude of a waveform. So you can see in this example here, I have the same amount of peaks and troughs in this image, but the high decibel one is way wider um, vertically than the lower decibel signal, right? And I can also demonstrate this again in max, um, a low decibel range, let's put this down at 100, for instance. Actually, let me make this a little wider so we can see an image. As I increase the amplitude, the, f the sound wave gets wider vertically, right? Not horizontally, that's pitch. So this is how we recognize the difference in amplitude. And again, this is about the intensity of a waveform, right? Okay? 
So that's amplitude. The next one is loudness. Now loudness is different than um, amplitude in that loudness is the perceptual quality or perceptual property of amplitude, decibels, as it relates to the physical properties of actual amplitude. Our perception of how loud something is in relation to other things and to other sounds is not the same as the actual physical properties. We may perceive a sound as louder when it is actually the same or less loud than another sound, okay? So this is mostly related to frequency or the frequency spectrum of a sound. So a good example is if I have a sound, for instance, at five decibels, and I have another sound at five decibels, we may hear one sound, one of those sounds as being louder than the other. And that is just the way the human brain is interpreting that sound is what's called loudness. And again, the physics of it say that these two sounds are identical in, in decibels at five, but they may not be, right, to our ears. Our ears may hear them as that sounds louder than the other one, but it may not be louder, okay? And that is what loudness is. The next one is the threshold of pain. The threshold of pain is the loudest sound that we can bear without pain, and it is approximately 120 decibels, okay? Um, and again, while this threshold is different for everyone, beyond 120 decibels, we begin to do physical damage to our ears, okay? So what I mean by that is, it doesn't matter whether it actually hurts to you to hear something above 120, Above 120, it is doing damage to your ears, right? And as I mentioned, like I, I feel like my threshold of pain is lower than this. Like it's around 100 to 105. I feel like I'm sensitive to sounds. And obviously, it really depends, again, related to loudness, what those sounds are, right? Um, some sounds could be low at 120 decibels, and they won't hurt my ears. But a higher sound can be very painful at a lower, at a lower volume right? Because of the, of the way loudness works. Okay, great. Going on here, clipping. So clipping is when the maximum possible decibels is exceeded by the output, right? Clipping causes distortion in the audio input, output. The signal is simply cut off when it exceeds the maximum possible decibels, causing distortion to the waveform. So the idea that I have a nice rounded sine wave here, and then if clipping occurs, that sound wave is cut off. It also actually reflects back into the waveform, which also causes distortion. But that's what clipping is. And again, the, the simplest uh, way that we see this, of course, is when a waveform exceeds, goes beyond the bounds, right? And we would start to hear this as clipping if we were in a, you know, actually, it's usually when you, you rec record the sound on the output but sometimes we do hear clipping, okay? So that is what clipping is. Um, and in logic, as we've talked about before, um, oh, let me make that quiet. In logic, if I make an audio file, um, and let me just grab something from the desktop. Um, here's, a, here's a single sample of something. I can't even remember what this is. Oh, it's a, the recording someone, a student is working with or something. So right now this volume is fine, but if I were to, so, and I don't see the clipping down here, right? If I play this sound again, it's fairly loud, but on my, my channel strip and my stereo output, right? We see into the red here, but we do not see it go beyond, and we don't see clipping here in the red box, right? So again, the problem would be if I see clipping in that red box, right? The plus 5.60 dB is bad. So I'm now clipping this track because I'm playing it too loud, okay? And that is what clipping is. The next one, your standard waveforms. So the three standard waveforms are the sine wave, which is again, the simplest waveform that we have. It has no overtones and no harmonics, the sawtooth wave and the square wave. Okay, and these do have distinctive sounds. So if I turn this up again, um, let me set this to 400. Okay, let me turn this up. So if I turn on the square wave, you see the waveform change and the saw wave. 
Um, these are different waveform shapes, right? And they just represent a different sound, a different harmonic spectrum. And these are the most common waveforms that we see, okay? So going on, timbre. Timbre is the perceptual properties of, sorry, the perceptual properties of timbre relate to the physical properties of the shape of a waveform, okay? Timbre for humans relates to how we distinguish between sound, different sounds. So the easiest example of this is I could play two, I could play, have two different instruments, a piano and a cello, both play middle C, and I recognize the difference in sound because of the timbre in part, okay? A better example might be like a cello and a trumpet because they can both sustain notes, right? So I can tell the difference between those sounds because they have a different harmonic profile than, um, than to each other, right? And that's what timbre is. That timbre is the difference between the sound of a violin and the sound of a trumpet. Each is made up of different waveform components, okay? Um, all right, going on. Noise and white noise. So as I mentioned in class on Monday, noise is often the pre pre represented as sounds without a definite pitch, okay? So if you think about drums, they're often not really tuned. And so hearing what the actual note of a drum is, there's a lot of noise inside drum sounds. So white noise in particular refers to sounds where all pitches of the spectrum sound simultaneously, right? Um, and then from your book, Hoskin refers to noise as the dr distribution of energy among all the frequency bands, right? With no discernible pitch, okay? And that's what noise and white noise are. And there are other types of noise, right? There is pink noise and brown noise, and these just basically are filtered a little bit differently to emphasize certain frequency ranges um, just for emphasis, okay? So going on, the next one, this is probably the most complicated uh, thing to think about, which is called the harmonic series, all right? And it's this idea, again, that every sound other than the sine wave, which is our simplest waveform, is made up of multiple sounds at once, okay? And it, that happens through what's called sympathetic vibrations, okay? So the idea, that if I play a single note on a piano, I'm not gonna hear just that single note. I'm gonna hear other notes that are also sounding above what's called the fundamental. So the fundamental is the loudest and lowest frequency of a sound, and then the sounds above that harmonic or that fundamental are called partials, okay? And they are, again, simple sympathetic vibrations over a fundamental frequency, and th that's how they work. So let's take a listen to what this is like, okay? Um, so a good example of this is if I go into Logic here and I pull up a piano, let's go here, grab a piano, Steinway Grand. Um, so if I play a single note in here, um, okay, and I add, let me go to the channel EQ, um, I'm going to play a middle C, I'm, I'm going to play an A, okay, because I know that's 440 hertz. <laughs> Actually, in this case, it's 220, probably. Um, you can see that this note, this sound is not just 220, right? It's all kinds of different sounds. There's a peak here at 1,000. There's a peak here near 2,000. So what I'm seeing are the harmonics of that sound, right? In addition, I'm seeing things below this because it's also related to whether or not the note um, it, it, so for instance, on the piano, if I lift the pedal, all the strings on the piano are allowed to vibrate, right? So when I play a single note, that note vibrates off of the other strings and makes them vibrate too, which is what causes this kind of loud resonant sound on the piano, okay? So, and that is happening through the harmonic series, okay? And as I mentioned on Monday, a very good way of thinking about this is the spectrum of light, right? We all know that visible light looks white to us, but if we can, we use a prism, shine that light through a prism, we see a, a rainbow, right? Because light is actually made up of a of a series of of waveforms of all of the color of the rainbow, right? At different wavelengths, sound is exactly the same. 
If I could fracture sound, it would fracture into the harmonic series, right? Um, so anyway, so let me just read this first paragraph here. Any note whose timbre is more complex than a sine wave contains the, the frequency that is heard, and that's called the fundamental, as the pitch of the note, the fundamental frequency, sorry, plus some frequencies above that that are heard not as pitch, but as the color or timbre of the sound, okay? And so that's really important. The harmonic series really defines and helps us understand timbre of, of pitches and of, of instruments, okay? So, and also the standard harmonic series is to take a frequency and to multiply it by, oops, let me turn this off over here, is to take the, a fundamental frequency and to multiply it, okay, by one and then by two and then by three and then by four and so forth up to 11. So my little synthesizer here does exactly that. As I input a frequency into here, so if I put 200, okay, you're gonna see that and hear the frequency of 200. It's a low frequency. Now if I multiply it by two, it goes up an octave. Let me turn this down a little bit. Three. So that is the, the natural harmonic series. You can see this is the output of my frequency band, 200 to 400 to six, eight, 10, so forth, okay? And so that is a demonstration of what the harmonic series does and what we hear from frequencies as we multiply them by one, by two, by three, up to 11, okay? Excellent, all right, going on here. The next one is Fourier's theorem. So this is a really cool concept, I think, about, and I mentioned on Monday, this is the idea of reverse engineering a sound, okay? It's also basically the concept of, I could get to the basic fundamental building blocks of a sound and create it from sine waves, right? The fundamental, so if you think about like, you know, every human being is made up of atoms, right? Atoms are the basic building block of the, of the universe. Um, and I know there are smaller particles than atoms, but let's start stick with the atom. So if I, if I knew the recipe for building a human being with atoms, I could build a human being from the basic atom, right? From your standard atom. And the same thing is true with sound. The basic building block of sound is the sine wave. So Fourier's theorem says that any complex spectrum can be expressed as the sum of sine waves of various frequencies and amplitudes. Fourier's theorem says that any periodic waveform can be expressed as the sum of as a sum of sine waves. Okay, so again, it gets down to the basic building blocks of the sound. Now again, sound is very complex. So the idea that I'm going to reconstruct the sound of a violin with sine waves is more complex than you can imagine. And as we've heard with fake violins, they, it's more successful than others, or than more or less successful, right? So in layman's terms, any sound you hear can be created by combining, combining precisely the right sine waves at, the, at specific volumes. In reverse, any sound can be broken down to its principal parts, right? So I could reverse engineer a sound and have the recipe for a violin, the recipe for a cello sound, the recipe for a bell, right? It just depends on what it is, okay? So that's what's called Fourier's theorem, and it's basically a concept that we use for building um, instruments with synthesizers, okay? So, and then the, the last bit here is covering some um, basic concepts with well, there's a couple of sections to go here, but the concepts and terminology that are related to logic, but also related to pro audio in general. And one of the biggest ones here is of course MIDI, right? MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And MIDI is a technical standard that describes the interaction between computers and electronic music instruments, right? So it used to be, as I've mentioned, that your computer and your separate instruments were separated. They, you, you had a synthesizer or a synth, synth module that was outside the computer that had to be put in the computer somehow. And that was done with MIDI cables, okay? And these MIDI values are really important. MIDI is still 
zero to one twenty seven, which has been that way since uh, basically the nineteen eighties, the early nineteen eighties. Okay, most commonly MIDI values control things like pitch, volume, velocity, pitch bend, modulation, and panning. Okay, but we can use it for other things. So velocity again, the concept of velocity is that a MIDI parameter that measures intensity of a note, okay? MIDI values are between zero and 127, with 127 being the most intense for velocity. And really important here, remember that velocity is not just volume. It is also represent, represents a change in timbre as an instrument is struck, plucked, or played louder, right? So we see this all the time with synthesizers where um, if I'm mimicking an instrument like a piano, for instance, if I have a piano note, right? Um, let me pull up, make a track here. Uh, close the window, make a track. If I have a single piano note here, a middle C, my velocity, and you can see the velocity here is represented as 80, okay? And as I go up, note gets louder, but it also changes to a harsher, more intense sound, right? As this goes down, it gets quieter, but it also changes in, in intensity, okay? And that's specifically what velocity is. Man, I feel like velocity control is so important for making instruments sound realistic and sound natural, right? Because if you think about a human being playing a piano, there, it's not physically possible to play all the same velocities for every note, okay? So um, just keep that in mind. Velocity, I think, is really important for creating in interesting music, okay? All right, volume, again, is just gain, right? So volume is our gain in decibels, and it's the channel strip gain slider. It has a value between 0 and 127 sometimes. So this is really fascinating to me. Um, if I have an external MIDI keyboard like we do in the MIDI lab, right? If I lock my, if I sync my volume slider with a value slider on the keyboard, the keyboard is sending a value, the physical keyboard, if I check, uh, connect a slider to it, a value between 0 and 127. In the computer, that gets converted into a way wider range. So the volume range is from silence at 60 dB to plus, sorry, to plus 60 dB, doubling the initial volume on the slider. So as sound enters from the keyboard, it comes in in values of 0 to 127. But in automation, for example, with volume, I have way more numbers, right? Um, because there's incremental values between these. That It's a decimal value, okay? And what I mean by that is this, right? If I go back to logic, if we look at my volume slider, right, it goes from negative 60 to, to, to positive 6, but it's a decimal value, right? There's 0.5. So that means there's actually a wider range than 0 to 127, right? It's actually 120 plus 12, so it's 132, I guess. Um, and Anyway, so that's important to remember. That's the values of gain, okay? All right, panning, of course, is represented as a value between 0 and 127, um, with 64 being that panning is in the middle. And again, panning represents the intensity of volume for each of the stereo channels in the stereo signal. So basically, right, whether or not I hear something out of the left channel or the right channel. Um, and a really important concept here, again, is what's called equal power panning. Equal power panning is the idea that I'm going to intensify the pan of the left or the right because um, when, you know, when panning happens, it silences the channel that I'm not using. And so that can make the sound get quieter, right? So that just makes it sure it gets loud enough or it stays sounding loud. Okay, going on here. So reverb. Um, reverb, these, and these are just general big concepts, right? We talked about these at the beginning of the semester. Reverb is, is the persistence of sound after the sound is produced. This is also related to resonance, right? The resonance of a space is the reverb of a space. 
This is the result of countless iterations of sine waves reflecting off of the surfaces of the surrounding environment and reaching the ear at different times. No distinctive repetitions are heard. That's really important about reverb. We don't hear repetitions. If you hear distinctive repetitions, that's called a delay or an echo, right? Now, obviously, it's very common to have reverb and delay at the same time, and so they're bo both occurring together. The next thing, the most important parameters of reverb, which I may, may ask you a question about this on test, are the reverb time, the time it takes for the sound to dissipate completely, um, the room size, which is a common parameter in reverbs, which helps determine and affects reverb time. Obviously, a larger room means longer reverbs, right? And then the dry and the wet. How dry is how much of the original signal is present without reverb, and then the wet is how much reverb is in the mix exactly, okay? So these are both really important terms. Okay, great, so echo and delay. Delay, again, is the distinctive reflections of an audio source measured in t delay time and gain reduction feedback, okay? Um, the most important parameters in delay are the delay time, and that's the interval at which the reflections occur. Now, most commonly in our beat-based, tempo-based music, that is based on note values. So quarter notes, half notes, eighth notes, whatever. Okay, and but it doesn't have to. There's often a button where I can either sync to the tempo or set my delay time to be just in hertz. Okay. Feedback is how much gain reduction occurs on each iteration of a sound. Okay, the less gain reduction, the more repetitions are heard. So feedback, again, is this idea that I send the sound back through. So once the sound exits, I send it back through the loop and I create this loop of sound going around over and over, right? That's what a delay does. So every time that, gain, that, that sound goes back though, the volume is reduced some, right? And when that redu reduction in volume causes the sound to dissipate away. So the less gain reduction there is, the longer the delay is going to last. The more gain reduction there is, or le more feedback, the less feedback there is, the quicker the sound is going to be gone, okay? And then the last parameter here is how much of the original signal is present with and without delay, okay? I will also link to you guys a bunch of videos that I've made on my YouTube channel, some are older, um, that explain like delay for 30 minutes, okay? So if you are struggling to understand what delay is, it might help you to watch those videos too. Automation, again, we all know what automation is at this point, we use it all the time, um, is the programming of parameters to change their values automatically over time in Logic Pro. Now I say Logic Pro, but it could be any DAW, Ableton, um, FL Studio, Pro Tools, they all use automation and they use vector lines and envelopes to do this, right? So track automation allows you to draw lines to automate the values of any parameter. The most common automation parameters, again, are panning and volume, okay? So going on here, filters and equi um, equalization. So filtering is so important and so common in our music. Um, so understanding the basic types of filtering is really useful. Filtering and equalization allows us to enhance, to add dB, or to remove dB of specific frequencies in the frequency spectrum, right? In Logic Pro, this is largely done in the channel EQ, pictured below. And one of the most important concepts here is what's called the cutoff frequency. So matter, no matter what type of filter I'm using, when does the frequency start to cut out, right? What is the frequency at which the filter starts to work, okay? So, and we have three most common types of filtering. The three most common types of filtering are, first, the high pass filter, which is also called the HPF. We see HPF all the time. And it filters out low frequencies while allowing high frequencies to pass, okay? The, high, the opposite of this is what's called the low pass filter, which filters out high frequencies while allowing low frequencies to pass. And then the last one, is the band pass filter. And the band pass filter allows a specific band of frequencies to pass 
like between 400 and 600 only, for example, okay? And related to this filter, we have two terms. The center frequency is the fre frequency at the center of the filter, right? So if I'm filtering at 200 hertz, for instance, 200 would be the center frequency. The bandwidth is the width of the filter. So as I mentioned, if I have a center frequency of 200 and my bandwidth is 100, then what I'm hearing is between 150 and 250, right? Because the center frequency is one or 200, so I have 50 on the bottom side and then 50 on the other side of the center. So that's 150 to 250, okay? All right, you guys, so this covers everything that I'm gonna be talking about with these. And again, as I said, I will link some videos from you that I've made in the past that are more in depth than all, the, all of this. Like um, they cover all the filtering really intensely. They cover reverb and de delay and, or reverb and re reverb and delay intensely. So if you are not quite understanding these concepts, you could watch those videos too as a practice, okay? Um, because again, if I ask you questions about these, you need to understand these things in your own terms, in your own words, right? Um, so, okay, anyway, so that's the end of this first video. I will post this this afternoon. We actually have class in like 20 minutes here, so, um, and we'll be talking about compressors and busing and sending, okay? I will see you then.